Good evening, everybody. It's nice to see some Words with Wine regulars around here. And to anyone who is new to the series or to St. Bernard's, welcome. Um, we're, ex we're excited to have you. This is definitely one of my favorite event series because we get to talk about classics and of course over a side of wine or whatever your choice of beverage is this evening. We'll go ahead and get started as people trickle in. We have a couple of housekeeping items and some introductions. Uh, my name is Sophia Zanowski. I am the Director of Development and Registrar at St. Bernard's and I am very excited to be here with you tonight for a very Trappist themed evening. I do have to say so myself. Um, a couple of really quick tech housekeeping things. Um, we ask that you keep yourself muted if you're not talking. I'll let Sister Nancy tell you how she's going to structure the evening, but just keep yourself muted um, if you're not if you're not discussing. Uh, you're welcome to keep your camera on or off, but just um, to minimize background noise. If you run into any tech issues, feel free to put them in the chat or send me an email. I'll try to troubleshoot them, um, and I'll, I'll monitor that as we go <clears throat> through the presentation. And then I do want to, before we get started, just give a couple of introductions about who our co-sponsors are and who our speaker is. So like I said, I work for St. Bernard's. If you are unfamiliar with us, we are a Catholic graduate theological school located in upstate New York with campuses in Rochester and Albany. And then we also serve students from across the country through our distance education program. <clears throat> we have a couple of master's degrees in theology and philosophy. And then we also have a couple of certificate programs that I like to plug specifically at Words with Wine because I find one of them really interests people who like this series. Um, these certificate programs, you get to take a cluster of our graduate courses centered around a niche topic, but you don't have to commit to a full master's degree um, and you don't have to have a bachelor's degree to do one of these certificates. One of them that people find really interesting if they like Words with Wine is our certificate in Catholicism and the Fine Arts. Um, and we also have ones in Catholic bioethics, catechetical leadership, and Catholic philosophy. We also open up all of our graduate courses to anyone from anywhere across the country or the world, really, um, who might want to just audit one of our classes where you get to participate in the discussion, sit in on the lectures, but you don't have to do any of the assignments or write any of the papers. And we just announced, actually, just um, not too long ago, that this summer, we are opening all of our courses for the summer up to anyone to audit one course for free. So um, we do this in the summer because our we have two summer sessions that are truncated. They're just seven weeks. So it's a little bit of an easier thing to take on. And we offer a lot of really fun electives in the summer. Um, we have a course on Mariology, um, a course on biblical archeology, span some courses in Greek. So we have a whole host of things that you could take or audit one for free. My mom likes to do this because she doesn't have to write any of the papers. <laughs> um, so it's a really, really neat way to get back in the classroom but not have to take on a lot of commitment. Um, we also have a virtual open house coming up on March 23rd where we'll talk more about that offer and then also some of our certificate programs and our graduate programs. So if anything that I just mentioned interests you, um, feel free to join that open house. We also have another event series that we run monthly in addition to Words of Wine. It's called Theology and Culture, where we talk about a hot topic, if you will, that's going on in the world and how that intersects with faith. So next month on April 8th, um, our Theology and Culture will be led by Sister Dr. Uh, Grace Miriam from the Religious Sisters of Mercy. And she is going to talk about um, the role of religion in healing, specifically to her experience of being a medical doctor in a hospital at the height of the pandemic last year, but then also just generally the role of religion in healing. All of these things, I'll be sending out a follow-up email with links so that you can check out and get more information. So stay tuned for that. And then for this series, specifically Words with Wine, we partner with a vineyard out in California called New Clairvaux Vineyard. Now, our namesake is St. Bernard of Clairvaux. He was a Trappist Cistercian monk. And so is their namesake. So we share that in common. We share our namesake in common. If you know anything about Trappist communities, they like to live out their motto um, or kind of their calling to a life of prayer and labor. And they do this by picking a product usually, and they produce that product really, really well. 
In this case, with New Clairvaux Vineyard, that product is wine, thus Words with Wine was born. Um, and this partnership literally spans coast to coast from California to New York. So we really loved partnering with them to put on these monthly events. And without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our speaker for this evening, our very own Sister Nancy Hawkins. She is an Associate Professor of Systematic Theology at St. Bernard's. Um, she's been a member of the Sisters Servants of the Immaculate Heart of Mary since 1978. Um, she studied French at Marywood College and Systematic the Theology at Duquesne and Fordham, um, where she got her, her PhD. She, her areas of research are the mystics, the theology of suffering, and the spiritual concept of the void. Um, she has taught for over 40 years at various different levels of education, really run the whole gamut, and now has taught uh, for us at the graduate level. And she loves sharing knowledge and engaging with her students, and her students really love her. She's also involved with a variety of boards and committees uh, through her IHM congregation. And so I'm going to turn it over to Sister Nancy to lead our discussion. Hey, look at all those people out there. All right. Good, I wanna, okay. I just have to get rid of the people that are in the way of the slide here. Go away. All right, slideshow from the beginning. Uh, is the volume okay? Um, Sophia? I, yeah, you sound good. Oh, good. Okay. I don't see anybody, but uh, that's okay. <laughs> well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Words with Wine. I'm Nancy Hawkins, as Sophia said before, and thank you, Sophia, for that lovely introduction. And I'd also like to thank Dr. Matthew Kuhner for um, inviting me to participate in this, this wonderful um, program. So tonight, I am going to be sharing my thoughts and um, we're going to talk about the amazing movie of Gods and Men. If you, anybody who knows me knows that I love to go to the movies. I love to think about how they were made. I love to learn about them. I like to know about the actors that are in them. And most of all, I love going to the movies with friends and then coming home and, and or going to a restaurant and talking about the film. And this particular film of Gods and Men is perfect for this. Uh, it is an extraordinary film, a very powerful film. And uh, it really moved me very much to put this presentation together. Uh, the movie really speaks to my heart, and I'm hoping that quite a few of you have seen the movie. If not, after this presentation, I hope you will try to get it and watch it, because it really is stunning. The way this is going to go is, for a while, I'm going to tell you some things about the background of the film, all right, things that are fascinating, who made it and, and some of uh, what was chosen to do when they were making it. Then I have questions for discussion interspersed on the slides. And so I will read the question and then hope that some of you will come in and share your thoughts. So those questions will be dispersed throughout the presentation. The title of this talk <clears throat> is The Monks of Tipperine, Walking with a Perfect Heart. By the end of the presentation, uh, you hopefully will know why this is the title of the presentation. So let us begin. I would like to start by reading a quote by the French author Albert Camus, who wrote L'Étranger, The Stranger. This is a perfect quote to begin the presentation. Algeria is a land and son, is land and son. Algeria is a mother, cruel and yet adored, suffering and passionate, hard and nourishing. 
more than in our temperate zones, she is proof of the mix of good and evil, the inseparable dialectic of love and hate, the fusion of opposites that constitute mankind. I think that this quote is, is perfect for the story that is going to unfold as we talk about the film of gods and men. She is proof of the mix of good and evil. So you're now looking at a slide that has the covers of three DVDs of this movie. And if you look at the middle slide, middle picture, you will see the title in French, Des Hommes et des Dieux, of men and of gods. Well, then you look at the English title and you'll see of gods and men. So in English, the title that was originally given to the film is switched around and I've spent a couple hours trying to figure out why. I, I've come to the conclusion that it falls, you know, in English, it's easier to say of gods and men than of men and gods. That is the only thing that I can come up with. So in French, it is des hommes et des dieux. Um, the film, I'm gonna tell you some things about the film. It won, it, well, it was made in 2010. It won the Grand Prix at the Cannes Film Festival, which is the second most prestigious prize you can get at Cannes. It won the César Award in France, which is the French version of the Oscar. It also won the Lumiere Award. Uh, Lumiere means light. In the United States, it won the 2010 National Board of Review Award for Best Foreign Film. And it was France's submission for Best Foreign Film for the Oscars in 2010. It did not win, but it was in the running. <clears throat> now, the monks were uh, killed and um, taken away in 1996. 10 years after the death of the monks, a Catholic French screenwriter named Etienne Colmar was just taken with the story <clears throat> and he decided a movie must be made of this. So he wrote a screenplay. He met with various theologians to, to talk about the theology of the story. And then he contacted the director of the movie, Xavier Beauvoir. He also sent his screenplay to the relatives of the monks for their approval. And obviously they gave it because the movie was made. The movie was filmed in an abandoned Benedictine monastery in Morocco. It was empty for 40 years. And they redid the monastery to look like the actual Tiburine monastery in Algeria. It took them only two months to make this movie, which is like unheard of. So um, this really was a, a work of love. And one more fascinating fact, and then I will move on. It opened in France to 442 movie theaters on the day it opened. In the first five days, 300,062, 671 tickets were sold. So a huge success. <clears throat> now these are, this is a photograph of the actors in the film. The man on the extreme left who's tall is plays Christian, the prior in the movie. His name is Lambert Wilson. And he, um, if you Google him, he's been in many, many movies. The man wearing the sweater plays Luke, the pharmacist. He died last September at age 89. Very well-known actor. I've seen him in countless movies. His um, father was English, his mother was French, so he speaks both languages. His name, Michael Lonsdale. And then down in the bottom, kneeling, the extreme left, is the man who plays Christophe. His name is Olivier Rabouidin. They are the most well-known uh, actors in 
the movie. Now, two of the monks were not captured that night. And I'll show you, you'll see the real photographs of them. But in the film, of course, it's the little man with the beard next to Chrétien, and it is the man next to him wearing the blue apron. In the film, they are not taken that night. The director wanted to use color, image, and silence to paint a visible likeness of the interior lives of these monks. In other words, he wanted those of us watching to you know, feel like we are actually there in the monastery with them. And he's taking their life and having it, it is the backdrop the outside of the monastery is a backdrop of conflict in North Africa at that time. Of course, they are Trappist monks. Their lives were made up of solitude and community, meditation and action, love and discipline. So, you know, I, I think when you watch the film, you really feel like you are there with them living their life. <clears throat> the film begins with this quote from Psalm 82, and this quote um, gives you the title of the movie. I have said you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. So I think it's important to give you a little history of what was going on in, in the years before this, uh, this incident. So these are significant historical dates. <clears throat> of course, the French colonized Algeria and that colonization took place from about 1830 to 1849. The monastery, <clears throat> Our Lady of Latlas, Latlas is the mountain range that is in Morocco and Algeria. Um, that monastery was founded in 1938. The Algerian War of Independence took place from 1954 to 1962, and over 200,000 people died during that War of Independence. In 1971, Christian de Cherge, the prior, enters the Latlas Monastery. Now he was from a well-known French military family and he actually served in the French army during the Algerian War of Independence. In the 1980s and 90s, Christian and his brothers are the rare Christians among Muslims in Algeria. <clears throat> On October 30th, 1993, the GIA and in uh, French it's the uh, Group Islamic Army, the Islamic Army declared war on all the foreigners in Algeria. March 26th, 1996, the monks are taken from the monastery and they were held captive for two months before they died. <clears throat> in May of 1996, the GIA announces the murders of the monks. And on December 8th, 2018, the monks are beatified in Algeria. Sophie, is there any way I can see any of the people or see me? Um, you can drag the, bo the box. Which box? Oh, it might have disappeared on your screen. It's okay. Just... That's all right. <laughs> This slide shows you uh, actual pictures of the Notre Dame de Latlas Monastery in Tiberi. And as you can see, you know, it, it's, you can see the mountains, you can see the Latlas Mountains in some of the slides. And you can see they had rolling lands, they had sheep, they, I think they had olive, olives, olive groves. Um, the slide down in the left-hand corner is the actual entrance by the statue of Mary. 
uh, it was not a small place. I, in one of the books I used for this presentation, I saw a drawing of the monastery and the film doesn't really let you see how big it was. <clears throat> so these are the actual monks who lost their lives uh, that are pictured in this film. Brother Christian, Brother Luke, the pharmacist, Brother Christophe, whose journal I read before this presentation, Brother Michel, Brother Bruno, Brother Celestin, and Brother Paul. And uh, I will be showing you the three texts that I read before this presentation. One of them is, is about uh, Brother Christian. So these are the actual monks. And what I think is fascinating is they are standing in the exact same positions as the actors were standing. So you have Christian at the end, uh, next to him, the monk who was not captured that night. Um, there's Luke so and uh, Christophe down on the bottom. So these are the monks from Tiberin. The two monks who were uh, not captured, one, uh, Amidin, died in 2008. And Jean-Pierre Schumacher died uh, at the age of 95 or 96 in 2019. So here's a picture of Father Jean-Pierre Schumacher. Died on April Fool's Day, 2019 at age 95. Uh, there's a picture of him with Pope Francis. You can see the mountains in the, in the middle picture, you can see the mountains behind him. And then that's the foyer of Tiberine Monastery. And there are about six people living there now. Uh, it's not a functioning monastery, but there are pilgrims and visitors all the time. So um, when you enter it, there's the pictures of the six monks. That's not it. Tell me what to do again, Sophia, to get some pictures of. Um, do you have that little box that we should that I showed you with the? Did it disappear? It, yeah. it should be up in the upper right hand corner, sister. Maybe it says, it says view. And you could click on that in the upper right and says, does it come up on your screen or no? No, it says on, across the top, um, remote control, mute, stop video, participants, new share. Uh, yeah, it doesn't it say have, view options. No. It might have disappeared when you shared screen. But if we want to do discussion, you could, you could turn off your screen share if you want to see everyone and then turn it back on when you go back to your slides. Oh, OK. We'll try that later. Okay. <laughs> there is no soundtrack in the film, except for chant in the liturgy. And one of the final scenes, if you saw the movie, you know it's, you will hear from Swan Lake. Now the actors had singing lessons with the film's music director. They also made a retreat to the Tamier Monastery in France with the director and the music director. And these experiences created a community among them, which spilled over to the movie. And I think you really feel that in this film, um, that there's something going on between them, even though they are not the original monks. <clears throat> and apparently, occasionally the actors would just start singing the Salve Regina. And the actor who plays Christian, Lambert Wilson, he loves music and integrates it into his daily life. This is a quote from Olivier Rabouidin. To chant, to chant the Psalms is to breathe together, to share the breath of life. Now, the monks were not the only martyrs in Algeria. Uh, I just thought you'd like to see some art um, in memory of them. 
On the extreme right uh, is a lovely icon with the monastery in the background with the mountains, the Latlas Mountains and the, uh, the monks. On the extreme left is an icon commemorating the death of m many of the uh, Christians and also many Muslims um, lost their lives during this, this period of history. You'll see there are women religious, men religious, uh, there's a bishop all throughout um, Christian's journal. You will see him say, oh, we found out that this, these people were killed, these people were killed. And in the middle, this is, uh, um, it's hard to see in this slide. If you look at the figure on the right, you'll see it's the, the monk's cowl and a book and his sleeves. And then the, the one on the left from the side, you'll see the cowl. And I think if you were standing near the one in the middle, you would recognize that it's a monk, but that's a, a memorial that is in um, Algeria. I also want to mention Charles de Foucault. Now Charles de Foucault um, was a martyr uh, in Algeria. He died in 1916. He was an officer in the French army, just like Christian. He was also an explorer, a geographer, and he became interested in the uh, Trappist, but then he left the Trappists to become a hermit. And he lived among the Berber, the Berbers in the desert. And his many writings led to the founding of the Little Brothers of Jesus and the Little Sisters of Jesus. And he, he lost his life. He was declared blessed in 2005. And on May 27th last year, the Vatican announced he will be canonized at a later date. But, you know, his life and his story are very much like the monks at Tiberine. Um, he wanted to be the among, the among the people. He knew their language. He, he, he loved them. It didn't matter that they weren't Christian. Same thing goes for the, the monks at Tiberine. So Charles de Foucault. Now, I read many reviews of this film. And I have to tell you, I didn't find one negative review. So here are three quotes from some of the reviews that I read. <clears throat> this is a film about conscience and the price you pay for following it. The monks emerge as remarkable men whose faith is motivated by compassion, introspection, and a sense of duty to help others. Their serene, calm, compassionate life is in contrast to the forceful, demanding, violent life of those who take them prisoner. So this is the first question for the evening. I tried to get on this slide the faces of as many of the, the monks I could, and of course the actors who is a friend of Luke's. So the first question is, and I hope a few people will want to answer it, which of the characters in the film did you resonate with the most and why? So what should I hit Sophia to see people? Um, maybe if you stop uh, screen sharing, if you hit stop you know the the red oh yeah the red there you go. okay there's everybody <laughs> okay which of the characters did you you know relate to the most in the film and and why so i just just talk <laughs> so i <clears throat> i related to the um to the monk who was really struggling mm -hmm and really wanted to leave. And when he asked Christiane, why are we being martyrs? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that that question really struck me. Were they doing it for the right reason? Um, and I think that Christiane's answer to him was what moved him to stay and to change his mind but they had such tremendous courage that the fact that he was really struggling with whether he had that courage of his convictions 
um, really resonated with me. Thank you. Um, when I when I saw this film, I was living in St. Louis and I was in a leadership role in my congregation. And I think I resonated with Christiane because um, at that time, uh, because of the way he was present to the, as, as their, as a leader, but one among uh, equals, he was their brother in terms of the community. And at the same time, he listened. Um, uh, I didn't catch the name of the person who just shared, but how he was there for them as they, as they struggled, as they, um, and he didn't make decisions for them, but allowed them to be in that struggle and he was there for them. And so I think that's why at that time, uh, I resonated with him particularly because of what my responsibility was then. Mm, that, and um, that makes sense. <laughs> Hi. My name Hi. is Marie. <laughs> Luke is the character in the movie who I resonated with because I just saw his empathy and the struggle that he had especially when he was caring for the persecutor, the person who was actually inflicting all of the pain and Luke is short on resources and medicines and he's not well, but yet he has to care for the sick in the hospital. And he had to have great courage to do that and love. And I also, uh, forgive me, I forget the name of the monk who was not taken prisoner but the one who slips under the bed. It's a uh, Jean-Pierre, Jean-Pierre. Sure. Yeah, that, that scene was so gripping. And then when he finds his friend, they're, they're, he's not alone, but when he emerges after they've all been taken, it was an unforgettable scene mm -hmm. and how they loved and cared for him. He seemed like he was the older, older in age among them, but he had he was just so willing to support his brothers and I could, I just, that scene was just an unforgettable when he comes out and finds just one of them left. Yeah. Well, thank you. I will move on now and I hope new people will talk when I do this again. <laughs> or I'll start calling on you just like I do in my classes. Charles. <laughs> okay, let's see. There we go. I I too really could re relate to Christoph by the by the way. And having when you read his journal, you know, you just really can relate to him. Okay. We have another little problem here. All right, Sophia, why can't I get the slide to move? Oh, I can see the slide on my end. So maybe if you hit your next arrow button, that might get the slide to move. My next arrow button. There you go. Okay. Now this scene, I can relate this to this scene as a religious because it's, you know, they gather together and Christiane actually sort of tells them what he thinks they should do. And the response in the movie is, we did not elect you to decide for us. <laughs> well, if you've been in religious life and you've gone to meetings, you know, there's a lot of that. That This is a moment, I think, where Christian, you know, he has to step back and, and, and realize that he cannot make the decision for all these monks, all right? And at, I think this is a turning point in the movie because they depart from this table, this scene, and the rest of the movie is really them wrestling with what should they do, all right? And Christian himself has to step back and realize that no, it has to be the whole group deciding this. 
It can't be just him uh, as the prior. So uh, for me personally, um, this was a uh, this was a key key moment. So here's a question: What role does nature play in the film? These are scenes of Tiberine and the mountains. And if you remember, Christoph takes a um, long walk. So would someone like to just share a thought on what role you think nature plays in the film? Uh, Sister Nancy, since uh, you called, up, called me out, I will say that um, <clears throat> the, the pastoral scenes in the film are very effective, I think. Um, they're, they're just, they're evocative of the stillness of the monastic life and the sort of peace that seems to be happening as the, as the film starts out um, between the brothers who in, are singing in unison uh, and the brothers and their neighbors, the Muslim clerics, the, the, the Muslim, the, where they attend the ceremony at the mosque and the, um, their appreciation of that, the market scene, you know, we have this, this sort of beautiful uh, cohesiveness between everyone. And then the routine of the life, the, the grabbing of the wood, the, the farming and the honey and, and all this, it sets up the, the prayer and work rhythm, so familiar for, for monastic life, but in this kind of um, peaceful, the, I feel like it, it is, uh, symbolizes or evokes the peace of their community and the peace of their hearts, uh, which is what Christian then is, Brother Christian is going out on this walk to find is the inner assurance and the inner peace that he's needing as he makes this decision. Thank you, Charles, very much. You know, that, that scene by the lake, it's a wide open space. And he needed that wide open space inside himself. And I think the, you know, seeing it in the outside, he can bring it into the inside. I love that you mentioned the wood. That's great, you know, the picking up of the, of the wood and the sheep. Thank you very much. Can I add something to that? Sure. Um, hi, my name's Natalie. And um, I know one of the scenes that, that really impressed upon me is, you know, towards the end with the sunflowers. And, and isn't this the response when Christian gives the, the struggling monk? And so um, I've been, during this time of the pandemic, listening to a lot of podcasts and literature podcasts and also writers, and especially like with writers like Flannery O'Connor or other writers where place and setting is is very important and they talk about they talk about the place and the scenery being another character in the story and so i really see that in this film where nature is like a character in the film and, and especially i think it's just it's so um emblematic with the sunflower because as is that's how we are to to follow god you know to um, to lean towards him. And so I found that really inspiring and beautiful. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Yeah, I thought too, um, at the very end of the movie, on the night that they're pretty sure that they're going to come and take them and Christiane is outside and it's pouring rain. And, he, you know, he's in such, he seems to be in such anxiety. And, you know, it just makes you feel like it's just the the skies are crying yeah. and he's crying. Yeah. Um, and it, it, that was another scene that for me was just, it was just amazing. Thank you. Um, I, uh, this is Elise. Um, I also um, thought about the vastness of the, of the landscape. Like even when they were driving, it's just so solitary and vast. And I thought, really there's no place to hide you can't hide here it's this vast and barren uh landscape 
And then at the end where they're trudging through the snow and going up, you know, to, to their death really eventually. Um, I thought this what a terrible way to die. You know, it's so cold and you know, that they're not even really dressed for it. Um, so yeah, I think the landscape played a, a big part in how you felt about what was going on. Thank you. So here's um, another question. Um, um, can I can I jump in on this too? Oh, this sure, is, please do. Am I am I heard? Yeah, okay. It's Christine. Um, I'll tell you, I was most struck by the difference um, of the of their environs around the monast at the monastery and everywhere else, everywhere else. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, in in the village, you know, where 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 the market is, the town. I, I mean, I'm not clear as, but. You, you can, I mean, the, the first scenes you see of the houses, it looks like a war zone. Oh, it was actually. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and it looks like a war zone. The, and then whenever you see the ground, it is rocky, mm -hmm. dry, um, no very little vegetation. I mean, the scene at the, at the, the market where you see these, these two poor mules there, you know, tethered there, they're just standing there. You know, there's no, there's no pasture. There's no, uh, the, the striking contrast between the verdure of their place and the rest of the country is, um, just struck me. That's all. They bring out all that beautiful honey. You know, they bring yeah. out. Honey. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, and they have. That, it's a beautiful place where they live. There are lots of their trees. There's grass. There's the. You, they're turning over that soil. Christophe is turning over the soil, right, with the with the tractor. That soil is dark and rich, and you know she's putting seeds in there. You know, it. It's quite a contrast. Thank you. So, Christian, of course, a key role in the movie. His real picture is over on the left. And then we have Lambert Wilson who's playing him. Now, I don't know if you remember the, oops, wait a second here, let's try this again. Um, I don't know if you remember the, the scene, the picture on the right, he seems to be writing a homily of sorts. And the, the camera comes in close on the desk. And one of the books, of course, is the Quran. And the real Christian was fluent in Arabic and, and actually, I'll say more about his personal life after this slide, but he, um, you know, there was no, uh, you know, uh, what do I have to say? Islam and Christianity functioned together for Christian. Um, he was not at war with the Muslim people or their holy texts. So that was, and that actually, in the one book I read about him specifically, that was not appreciated by all the Trappists in his group, not the fellows at the monastery, but other ones who knew of him were not always supportive of how much he uh, felt the Quran, you know, was just as sacred as the Bible. So would anyone like to respond to this question? What is your response to this, this character um, in the film? Um, hi, I uh, loved that you brought up that scene where he realizes that all of the monks need to make the decision together and he can't go out ahead and, and decide for anyone um, because then the scene later it comes up again and everybody's going around the room and saying if they think they should stay or think they should leave and you watch him like put on patience a little bit, mm -hmm. listening to everyone, letting them have their say. And everybody knows that he wants everyone to stay, but he chooses not to say it and says, we just need more time. And I, I just, 
from that moment on, you you watch him with other brothers talking to uh, people from the village and letting them say like, we might be leaving actually, we'll abandon you and you're gonna be on your own and hearing their responses, you again, he doesn't say anything. He doesn't try to take this decision away from the people who, it, like if you're choosing martyrdom, you that can't be decided for you. Um, so I was just, really struck by his patience and the love that he showed for his brothers when he clearly has reason to, to feel conflict with them, um, but he, he doesn't act out of it. I thought it was really beautiful. He's a very noble character. Mm -hmm. um, here is some information on the real Christian de Cherge. He was a unifier he sought to expand his Christianity to make a place for Islam. And he did believe that Islam had something to teach Christians. One of his quotes is, only forgiveness can break the chains of hatred and violence. He would call himself a mandian de l'amour, a beggar of, for love. And he wanted the monastery to be a place of hospitality for everyone. Now he wrote a uh, testament to be read and I'm gonna read you part of it. It's in one of uh, the books that I read for this presentation. He, um, and there's a scene, you see him, I think that might be what he's writing in that particular scene I talked about. And then he leaves it in his bedroom, uh, his last testament. He was very close to a man named Muhammad who was a, um, a policeman in the village. And there was a lot, I'm, I'm not sure if he and Muhammad were attacked by a group, but Muhammad actually saved Christian's life one afternoon. He, he put himself in between Christian and the person who wanted to attack him. The next day, Muhammad was dead. And uh, Christian just carried that around in him. Um, and, you know, uh, Muhammad had imitated Christ in, in really saving Christian. And these are three uh, real photographs of Christian. In the top left, he is at prayer with uh, some of the Muslim people. I like the one in the bottom left. You know, he's relaxed and he's, you know, out, outside and smiling. And the, the larger picture on the right, I, I keep looking at it and thinking, is that man who is sitting next to him with the beard, is that Muhammad? You know, I've decided he's Muhammad, whether he's Muhammad or not. And of course, there's another uh, monk behind him. So Christian really um, participated in the life of that, that village. It meant a lot to him. Now, this is a key scene in the film. And uh, if you read the journal of Christophe, he writes about this. And of course, it's Christmas Eve. Um, and uh, the man being featured, who's the head of the group that come to the monastery wanting medicine uh, comes. And when that happens, Christophe, and another monk go into the basement to hide. And if you read the journal, you see that Christoph is not proud that they hid in the basement. And, and he comes out of the basement and, and sort of has a bit of a conversion experience after that, that evening when he hid. And of course, I, I think this is such a, an amazing scene in the movie because C Christian says, you know, this is the evening of the Prince of Peace, Jesus, the man recognizes that Jesus is mentioned in the Quran. And what Christoph writes in his journal is what I have here. He writes, the home port is your body as the beloved. Do not hold me back for I go up to my father and your father. During the night of December 24th, 25th, we passed over from the home to the body. Now I've been pondering this, <clears throat> what does he mean? And I, I think he's saying, maybe he's saying, you know, we're becoming the body of Christ in this experience, all of us, part of the mystical body. I don't know, but I thought um, 
it's obviously a very important moment for the film and also a very important moment for Christoph personally. Here are some words of Christian. Quite often I have seen arising from the Quran in the course of a disconcerting reading, a shortcut of the gospel, as it were, which then becomes a true path of communion with the other and with God. Our order needs monks more than martyrs. Our answer has to be that we are truly being monks by continuing to live here the mystery of Christmas itself and being exposed in this way from the cradle on to the massacre of the innocents. And of course, the quote I read earlier. <clears throat> so would anyone like to uh, take on this question? What you've all, you've all hinted to it a little bit so far. What did you notice about the relationship the monks had with the people? Sister Nancy, Michael. Hi, Michael. They, they seemed very in, integrated and um, one with the community and with the people, and they just showed care for everybody, and everybody responded to that very, very, uh, very well. It was one of the things that absolutely impressed me about the whole um, about the whole movie. Yeah, is the coming together of the cultures. They didn't see them as the other, you know. They were their friends, and yeah. Uh, may I add something? Sure, you may. Um, the, uh, it was just a beautiful relationship. And it kind of reminded me of the story that my dad told me in World War II. Um, he was Italian American. His parents were born in Italy, but he was in World War II in Italy. And the Americans were going to overtake this town because Italy hadn't sided with the Allies yet. But when they went into Italy, <clears throat> uh, the general, the captain, whoever was with him said, you know, to my dad, okay, we're ready to overtake this town. We got to do it and get the, you know, get the town. And when they walked, they were walking. And when they walked into the town, my dad said, these people in the town, he, they saw my dad's face. They could see he was Italian. And he told the captain, the, these people are not the enemy. The people are not the enemy. And when the people, and then my dad started talking Italian to the people. And they saw that he accepted them and they accepted him. And they immediately took tables from their houses and put in the street and got food for the GIs. And, you know, the, 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 the head soldiers, they were just amazed. And they didn't, you know, bomb the town or anything. So it was interesting. It kind of always reminds me that they were there for the people. And the people were not the enemy. They never saw the people as the enemy. They never did. They never did. And they mourned everybody who lost their lives. The Croatian people, you meant, we were mm -hmm. killed. Um, they prayed mm -hmm. for everybody. Yes. And wanted to be the, present. Mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. so thank you. So you remember this scene, if you've seen the film. It's a very moving scene. Um, why did the monks choose to stay? What? You don't have to talk about each of them, but what what brought them to um, this point where they could all say, "I'm staying. I'm not going." Anybody have a thought? Yes. Hi, everyone. I have a thought about that. It seems like they had because of their faith in their relationship with each other and their relationship with the community where they lived, they had, they could come to no other conclusion. Uh, I think their, their faith compelled them to stay, their care about each other and their care about their community. There was just never, they couldn't justify leaving, I think. I agree. <laughs> Um, I, I, I think I have the same perspective, but I'd point to something 
a little, I'd point to something. There's a scene, and I don't remember which of them, I'm sure Chrétien is there. Um, Christiane is there. Uh, maybe it's uh, Luke. I, I know, I think there's another monk there. Maybe it's not Luke. Um, but I think you're supposed, and they're with the villagers, the elders. It's clearly the elders of the village that they're sitting with. And the elders are, are just tearing their hair out about all this. They just, they hate it. They hate it. That's one, that's one scene. Then there's another scene. I think it's another scene where a woman is there too, mm -hmm. and she speaks. Yes, she does. And um, she and 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 they say, "My mom, one of, one of the guys I think says, my older man, my mother thought that that the monastery was part of us, something like that, and." And, and someone, maybe it's the, uh, the woman, says, uh, if you leave, and she, they're, both, they're all pretty much asking them to stay. Please stay. Please and you're stay. happy to know that the quote is on the next slide. Ah, okay, <laughs> the thank you. What the woman thank says. You. But I, I think for the, for the viewer, yes. that, Very powerful, that, right? that moment changes everything. Yeah changes everything because otherwise, to be perfectly honest, I think they would have been, I would have thought, had I been they, I would have thought we're endangering these people. But it's different if they want you to stay. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Sister Nancy, can you hear me? It's Elaine. Yes, I can, Elaine. Great. Um, I thought that individually they all came to what I think it was the monk uh, brother, Michelle, I think, who, uh, when they were going around the table and offering, uh, they were deciding amongst themselves with the first inquiry. Mm -hmm. And he reminded me of Peter, given mm -hmm. the opportunity to leave by Jesus. And he says, but Lord, where would we, go? Would we go? Yeah, yeah. And um, Brother Michelle says that, and I thought they all came to their same conclusion. Um, where would we go? Where would we go? Here are some lines from the film. When Christoph and Christian are out in the garden in that wonderful scene, Christian says to Christoph, you have already given over your life. You know, it's not coming in a few days. You have already given over your life. And then uh, Christoph um, says, or actually Christian says, we were called to live here with these people who are afraid. Now, if someone says the first time they're talking about this, I did not come here to commit a collective suicide. I can't remember who that was. This is before they decide to stay. And then of course, Christoph is struggling and he says to Christian, I pray and hear nothing. And this is what the Muslim woman says in that scene, you are the branch and we are the birds. And then someone says uh, the day they decide to stay, a good shepherd does not abandon the sheep. And then one of the monks says, I have no place else to go. This is my family. What theological truths shine through this film? Anyone like to tackle that one? I have it. I have a question. I have a comment. <laughs> so uh, all of my life I've had on my uh, bulletin board a little quote that comes at least um, by reputation from Dan Berrigan that says, if you're going to follow Jesus, you better look good on wood. And uh, I mean, I think, I think most of us aren't called to this kind of martyrdom but if we truly are trying to live our faith there's going to be some level of martyrdom or it's not really <laughs> uh it's not really true there's something missing if we don't have some level of kind of having to stand up for our faith and i mean most of us don't have to die die but <laughs> right. um at some point it does come to us there's so. always a conversion that's going to take place 
Yeah. But also death. <laughs> like death, yes. Like and real we, sacrifice. And yeah. do, is it really death, death, or do we believe something beyond that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Anyone else? Uh, they they for me, this is Laura. Um they personified for me what love is all about. I mean, it, I mean, and it's shown in so many different ways. Um, it, even uh, Sister Nancy, the, the piece about where you, you know, they do that shot where they show the Quran, you know, zoom, zero in on that and how their relationships with the people, they weren't their, they weren't the enemy or the, they weren't other, they were one with them in, in a, uh, so that to me, they were the personification of that, f- not only for themselves in an insular way, but much, much broader. I don't know if that makes sense. Oh, yes. Yeah. I think the Paschal mystery, I think the whole film is the Paschal mystery, you know. It's also about fidelity to one's vows. Yes. All of us have made vows through our baptismal commitment or accepted those vows for ourselves. And one of the vows I believe the Trappists take is a vow of stability, which means to stay in the place. Yep, very and this good. This is all about whether or not to live that vow, no matter the cost. All right, let's move on here. Okay. All right, I am now going to um, take you through five slides. If you saw the movie, you know that this is uh, an incredible scene, the scene where Luke puts on Swan Lake and brings out the bottle of wine. And they, it's just extraordinary. You know, at first, when you look at their faces, they are, they are filled with joy that they're with each other. You know, a man arrived from another monastery, brought them cheese, brought them letters, you know, brought them news. And the, the, the director just pans their faces. And then there's, there's a turning point where all of a sudden you see in their eyes that they know, that they know this may be the last supper. They have figured out that something probably will happen. And then there's a little despair, maybe a little sadness, a little fear, 
and then all of a sudden their faces are transformed again. And this is, this is a very different face you're looking at. It's, it's thanksgiving for each other, for who they are together, for what their life is. Um, uh, it's just, it's, and it's, it's an extraordinary scene. So I really wanted to um, play the music. This is a quote by Thomas Beckett, who was murdered in the cathedral. That's what the little picture is down the bottom during the reign of Henry II in England. And this quote is in Christoph's journal. The martyr no longer deserves anything for himself, not even the glory of undergoing martyrdom. And I, when I was reading these, you know, I asked myself, what what is Beckett, Thomas of Beckett, trying to say with these words? And why did Christoph write them in his journal? And today I was looking at these slides again and I thought, well, you know, you can, you can <laughs> say I want to be a martyr and, and be full of yourself. Um, so I think Beckett is saying, you know, you really, if you have to let go of it all, you know. Don't, don't even think that the martyrdom is some kind of a, of a glory. And that's maybe why Christoph, knowing that he would probably face this reality, put that in his journal. Now, John Kaiser wrote one of the three books, extraordinary book that I highly recommend. You will see the faces of the, of the books soon. This was in his book, and I thought it was interesting. He writes, the monks were not martyrs to their faith. They did not die because they were Christians. They died because they wouldn't leave their Muslim friends who depended on them and who lived in equal danger. So that's just another um, perspective uh, that I wanted to share. I'm not asking anyone to share this question uh, verbally tonight, but I think this is a question we all have to ask ourselves after you see a film like this, a film about the Monastère Notre Dame or Lady of the Laplace. You know, how are you personally impacted by this film? You know, what was going on in you as you were watching it. I happened to see it on Good Friday when it opened. You know, we went to the services and then another sister and I went right around the corner. And I have said to so many people, it was the absolute perfect film to see on Good Friday. So I would just encourage you when you think about the film to, to let yourself have that question floating around in you. Um, what happened inside of you as you watched this film and as you ponder the story? I found this quote in my research. I thought this was uh, good to share. It's from a man named Hugh Johnson, who was, uh, who is, well, was then an American Methodist pastor. He writes, I think the killing of the monks was a turning point. Algerians were genuinely revolted by what happened. People were affected not only by the way they lived, but also by the way they died. And I, I, I'm a big fan of Thomas Merton, but I, um, I really like this quote. He who gives himself freely over to God truly loves him and receives back the freedom that belongs to God's children. He will love as the Lord loves and will be carried away a captive of the invisible divine freedom. And these monks found a spiritual freedom that they needed in order to say yes to what was going to happen to them. <clears throat> now, Two months after the monks were taken, um, the GIA released a statement saying that they had been killed. Uh, their bodies were never found, only their heads. 
um, and their heads are buried in, at the monastery. The families of the monks insisted that they be buried in Algeria. Now, there is not, a cl not clarity on exactly what happened that caused them to die. Uh, one theory is that another group came along and took them captive. But I've read this in three different places and one comes from a, a French general. Another stronger theory is that the Algerian army decided to act and flew in with their helicopters, which they did often because of the terrain and sprayed everybody, you know, with, with machine gun fire and inadvertently killed the monks. And because that would have been a terrible scandal for the Algerian army, they are the ones who uh, severed the monks heads and took the bodies. Um, I can't tell you anything else except to know that, that the families really insisted that they be buried in uh, Tiburin. And as I said before, this is a huge pilgrimage night and not just for Christians. Okay, the, the Algerian people come to pay their respects at this, at this monastery. On December 8th, 2018, at the chapel of Our Lady of Santa Cruz in Algeria was something that had never taken place in a Muslim nation. It was the beatification of not only the monks, but at least 20 other um, Christian martyrs in Algeria. And one of the uh, prelates from the Catholic Church said, we did not want to hold the beatification just among Christians, as these brothers and sisters died alongside thousands of Algerians. So um, it must have been an extraordinary experience to, to be there. All of these martyrs have been declared by the church as patrons of ecumenism, persecuted Christians, and missionaries. And uh, they will be canonized uh, at some point in the future. This is the uh, last line in Christoph's journal that he wrote about two weeks before they were taken. One, one experience of the season of Advent, oh, excuse me, got to backtrack. <laughs> this is just another quote. This is not his last quote, but I want to read it. One experience of the season of Advent has suddenly been integrated into the problem of the church in Algeria. The important thing is that we have not left. So these are the three books that I read to get ready for this talk. And I also read many things online. Um, the one on the left um, is by Christian Salison, and it is called A Theology of Hope. And it explores the life and the theology of Christian de Chargé, who was the prior. Born from the Gaze of God is Christophe's journal and it contains some of his drawings. And the one on the right is a very substantial scholarly book. I, I learned so much from the monks of Tiburin, Faith, Love and Terror in Algeria by John W. Kaiser. Um, so these are wonderful. Uh, if you're interested in this story and wanna read more, these are wonderful books. They're all on Amazon and I highly recommend them. This is the last quote in, last thing Christoph uh, wrote in his journal. With the beloved disciple, I take you to my home. Near you, I am offered up. My song is about kindness and justice. I shall walk in the way of perfection. When will you come to me? 
I shall walk with a perfect heart. Je marcherai avec un cœur parfait. And that, of course, was on the slide I showed you in the beginning. At the bottom of that page in the journal is a little heart next to a cross. So that's not the original drawing, but that's as close as I shall get. I shall walk with a perfect heart. So I would like to close and there will be room for uh, comments and questions, but I'd like to read a little bit for you from the Testament of Christian de Charge that was opened on Pentecost Sunday, May 26th, 1996. He writes, if it should happen one day, and it could be today, that I become a victim of the terrorism which now seems ready to engulf all the foreigners living in Algeria, I would like my community, my church, and my family to remember that my life was given to God and to this country. I ask them to accept the fact that the one master of all life was not a stranger to this brutal departure. I would ask them to pray for me, for how could I be found worthy of such an offering? I ask them to associate this death with so many other equally violent ones, which are forgotten through indifference or anonymity. For my life has no more value than any other. So if you wanna ask questions, go ahead. I may or may not have the answers, but feel free. <laughs> or anything you would like to say. The floor is yours. I can see all of you. That was quite the mic drop, Sister Nancy. Nancy out. <laughs> I'm really good at that, you know. <laughs> I wanted to say something, Joseph. Uh, when I look at this situation, I kind of look at a coin with two sides. Uh, side one is I, I met a monk from uh, St. Catherine's uh, Monastery in right below Mount Sinai. It's been around since like between 400 and 500 AD. And they have an incredible relationship with the, oh, I forgot the name of their, uh, Bedouins, the Bedouins. Uh, they protect that monastery from any group who tries to overrun it. So there's this incredible relationship between the Muslims there and the uh, Orthodox monks there. It's a beautiful thing when you uh, see that and you hear it from a monk, that uh, these are their friends, these are their brothers. It's an incredible relationship there in Egypt. The second side of the coin is when you listen to a Coptic Orthodox Christian, what it's like to live in a Muslim world. One of the things they'll tell you is you need to get used to the fact that you're a second rate citizen. It's just the way it is because that's what they've known all their lives. So what that means is you can easily be fired from your job. You won't get a promotion. Uh, if they know that your child is a Christian in a particular uh, school, it's not unheard of for that child to be failed. So this is what it's like for them to live there. And it's just something they accept because that's the way it's always been for them. So it's a tough life. Mm -hmm. And the girl I know, Christian, she said the only reason she has the name Christian is because 
her family was able to leave Egypt. And so the father felt that it was safe to give her a Christian name. Mm. So you have these two sides there. It's, a, it's an incredible tension of give and take like that. Thank you, Joseph, for sharing that. Well, this is Jean. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say that was a really nice presentation, sister. I really enjoyed it. And I, I was able to watch the movie uh, today. Uh, and the thing that struck me about it was it didn't seem like they were actors. It seemed so real. The, the characters, I felt like these were the monks. You know, it's yeah. Yeah. it was just... It well, I really, I think so they bonded. Real. I really believe the the men, the actors, bonded. You know, I, that was so apparent, and and the the one scene that really struck me, um, uh, that we didn't come up, but I, uh, it's lingering with me, is when um, Christian goes and puts Luke to bed. Uh, yeah. When he's ha has fallen asleep, and he. Just like a parent with a child, how much care he had for his brothers. Mm -hmm. And um, it just was so tender. And it was a perfect example of, I think, brotherly love in Christ. Yes, it is. Yes, it was. Thank you, Jean. Welcome. Yeah, Sister Nancy, it's Laura again. I. I just am so eager. I have the DVD. I mean, I don't buy a lot of DVDs, but that was, I, I got it. Uh, it there was a theater, uh, like an arts theater near where we were. And that's how I got it because it was just so, um, just so incredible. And so I'm eager to be able to view, see it again. And I, I'm thinking about Good Friday now, but so many of the things that you shared with us tonight wouldn't aren't things that I was aware of, and even uh, whoever was just speaking, Jean, um, that uh, that sense of uh, the the uh, spirit of the actors. Uh, I picked. I remember picking that up. I thought this is amazing, but I didn't realize, based on what you shared with us tonight, that all the ways their effort to become that together uh, in a way, you know, it just was such a gift for us as the, the viewers, so to speak. So thank you for all that you shared tonight. It's like opened up so many things. Being a French major, it was really nice to, you know, it's nice to hear French. And their French is easy to understand, I, I thought. <clears throat> Anyone else have a question or a thought? Um, I wanted to share something. Um, I, I am part of a lay ecclesial movement um, in the church, communion liberation. I know one of your professors, I was here at the first one of the word, um, Apollonio, who gave the presentation on Father Giussani. So I, I'm in the, that community. Um, and a close friend of our community is Father Mauro Lepery, who's actually the Abbot General of the Cistercians in Europe. Wow. And um, one of the things we're working on during Lent is his letter. And he mentions the, the, the monks of Tiburon. And so if I could just read a couple of sentences, because I think this speaks to your question about how, you know, what do the story of the monks have to do with us, you know, in our lives? And so Father Lepery says, taking our conversion seriously is an enormous responsibility because God has mysterious place within our conversion, the response to the dramatic question of the entire world. The whole history of Christian monasticism from St. Anthony the Abbot to the holy monks and nuns of today, like the blessed brothers of Tiberine has always been motivated by the desire to embrace conversion as a response that Christ enables us to accept and transmit to all mankind's question of meaning. Mm 
Mm. Um, and if anybody's interested, you can go to the Cistercian website and read the whole letter. But um, nice. it's just one of those moments mm. where, you know, when things pop up in different places of your life, like this lecture tonight, I'm like, oh, somebody's telling me to pay attention. So I just wanted to share it. And thank you for your beautiful presentation. Thank you. And thank you for sharing that, Natalie. Well, it's time to go to bed. <laughs> Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, it, it was a real gift for me to put this together and it's even more of a gift when there are people who want to talk about it. So thank you very much. And uh, I wish you all a wonderful Holy Week and a beautiful Easter. Goodbye. Thank you so much, Sister Nancy. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Goodbye, you. Everybody. Yeah.